Okay, it's really brilliant. Everyone's having so many conversations. <laughs> it shows what the um, first session sparked, which is great. Okay, for so can you hear me? So for this session that we're going to move into now, um, I really want to uh, warmly welcome uh, Derby MacDonald, who I, I would imagine most of you know. Um, and we're delighted that, that Derville agreed to chair this session for us. Um, Derville is currently the group business editor um, of the Irish Independent, and I'm sure many of you will have seen she also was um, awarded the Tatler Media Woman of the Year. Um, Derville has written quite extensively on this issue um, previously in her previous role in the Independent, and we're, we're really delighted that she's going to chair this session for us, so thanks, Derville. Thank you very, very much. It's a, it's a real honour for me uh, to be here this morning. Um, I, I currently work as group business editor uh, of independent newspapers, but uh, it's a role I took up in March, and uh, any of you who will be familiar with my work will probably know uh, my work as a, a legal affairs writer for both um, the Irish Independent and the Sunday Times. Um, uh, along with a certain clause in the Irish Constitution, uh, the issue of sexual violence um, is probably one of the, the issues I've written most extensively about in my legal, um, legal affairs career. Um, I was a rookie reporter in the Sunday Times um, in uh, 2002 when the Savvy report came out. And uh, you'll probably remember at that time the country was still very, very much convulsed uh, by the clerical sex abuse crisis uh, with uh, programs such as Cardinal Secrets that had come out at that time. And I cut my teeth on the issue of uh, clerical sex abuse and, and that's where I started, I suppose, to to learn and to write about um, sexual violence at that time. Can anyone remember why the Savvy Report was called Savvy? No, it wasn't. It was called Savvy because it was a play on the word Savvy, um, which means to have an understanding of, um, uh, which is very, very clever, not just was it sexual assault and violence in Ireland, but it was a play on that word Savvy. Um, and in her foreword at the time, um, one of Nolene's uh, predecessors, Brida Allen, said that while the study at that time in 2002 was of major importance, as it still remained, that it was only with this type of regular um, research that we could be informed. Um, I've been staggered um, over the last 14 years um, by the failure to repeat savvy um, at regular intervals. It's frustrated evidence-based policy. It's um, helped us, it's prevented good prevention strategies being put in place and it's stymied public debate. And I know earlier on people were talking about the lack um, of debate. As a legal affairs writer, often what we were reporting was the tip of the iceberg. It was the prosecutions, it was the murder, it was the rapes, it was the domestic violence cases. But in many senses, we were only dealing with the end game. Um, and it was very frustrating for us as writers not to have the type of information that we could inform the public about. Um, women, children, and men who were victims of domestic violence and other forms of sexual violence have paid a staggering price uh, for that failure uh, to inform and the failure to track. And I suppose now in my new life um, as a business editor, what staggers me um, is how any society or any economy could fail to track something that cost us an estimated and probably conservative estimate of 2.2 billion euro a year. And while it's great to see so many familiar faces um, here today and great to see so many men, it's actually quite appalling that we do not have business leaders here, we do not have the private sector here, and that we do not have others. Can you imagine? It's a not insignificant slice of a, a certain apple pie, you might say, 2.2 billion euro a year. And I think that uh, one of the things that should come out, and we, of course we don't, as Lynn said correctly, we don't want to frame this in terms of the financial cost, but it is one of the costs, and I suppose that it's a, it's a lens that we can and should um, see this through. So look, it's an honour for me um, to be here today, even though we have three newspapers going out this evening, but it's an honour to be here this morning. Um, woo, panic. Um, but um, somebody else who's also very, very busy um, and has to head off to an important meeting with the, the new European Investment Bank. Maybe they could invest, Deirdre, in yeah. something like this, um, in something like this uh, research. But Deirdre Clune, uh, she needs no introduction. She's the MNC for the South constituency, and she has advocated extensively um, on behalf of women and all victims of, uh, of violence. And I wonder if you give her a warm welcome to speak to us this morning. Thank you very much.
much, Dervis, for that introduction. And um, I suppose th three newspapers today. Give it, they, what's the old saying? Always give, give a busy person uh, plenty of work, and it'll happen. So well done on that, and congratulations on your new role. And I want to thank um, National Women's Ob the Observatory, uh, European Parliament, and um, National Women's Council for hosting today's event and for giving me an opportunity to speak to you from a, a, a European perspective, maybe a local perspective too. Um, uh, and I'm delighted to do so. And I'd like to acknowledge Lynn and thank her for her contribution. She probably stole all my lines and the European perspective. We both have the same perspective um, or coming from, from Europe. I have to thank her for that. And uh, Minister David Staunton previously outlined um, where we are in Ireland in terms of uh, moving to ratify the Istanbul Convention. Uh, I myself in 2011 was um, appointed or from, from when I was a member of our national parliament to PACE, the um, <coughs> Parliamentary Association of the Council of Europe. Uh, I'm now a member of the European Parliament. Um, they're both different, different but, but linked, different organisations but linked. Um, and every week or every month we go to Strasbourg Lynn and myself will be going on Monday. The Parliament sits for four days every month in Strasbourg. Yeah. It's a long, it's a journey, but it's a beautiful, beautiful city. As Christine knows, she lives there. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful city. But I, from the time I'm going to Strasbourg in 2011 and attending PACE, um, I've always struck and in all, well, to stand to attention to the European Court of Human Rights is there. And as if one tram stop, you have the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, and the European Court of Human Rights which is, of course, linked to the Council of Europe, exists because of the Council of Europe. And it's a, a very significant building. I don't think it's, it's not my favourite in an architectural point of view, but I certainly think it, it's of, it is of major significance and it's a, a building I always respect and admire and someday I'm going to go in there and just sit and listen. I think it's probably before, before it, my term is up, it's something I really wanted to do. I want to do because um, it's been so, so effective. We're talking today about the Istanbul Convention and you know, the Council of Europe, it comes from in, in the Parliamentary Assembly that I sat there, there was 47 member states represented. That's a lot of member states coming, and you have, if you think of the member states, you've got 27, 28 European mem members of the European Union, but you also have a lot of countries outside of the European Union. Uh, I'm not going to, to there were show, actually, Christine, you had a map there, but it's all uh, outside, uh, to the east of Europe, particularly Turkey, Albania, Moldova, lots of, uh, the, list, the list is there, 47 of them. And to get 47 member states, now I know they're not all, they haven't all signed it yet, um, but they, they will do. Uh, in fact, of the 40, 22 have ratified it, 43 of the, for, of the 47 have signed the convention, <coughs> which is, it, and, and, and I don't, I'm sure countries absolutely don't take that, that lightly, it's just the, the signature process, or the ratification is what we really want. But really, the a convention, it's bringing all those countries together, trying to get them to one place in terms of uh, protecting or eliminating gender-based violence, if it can do that, and all the issues that, that surround that. We'll have, I know many of you are practitioners working, engaging with, with women and men and children as well, and children are mentioned in the previous session, and they're ver very important to mention that, that the, the, rep the um, impact that gender-based violence, domestic violence, has does have on children. So um, it's a significant achievement to get the Istanbul Convention. 2011 was established, so it was the directive was put in place, and it's, it's really to get all those countries. And I see it even in the European Union, where we sit, where Lynn and I are the twen 28 member states. You know, sometimes people criticise the European Union, and they say, you know, like it takes ages to get a decision, ages to get the 28 member states to agree on one page. It does. But uh, somebody, sp uh, a comment I heard at the beginning when I was elected, uh, you know, like you think, like if you're going to run, if you're going to run a race yourself, you go off and do it, great, you'll be able to do it very quickly yourself, and you can, you know, you have great, a great record, you may have a personal achievement there, great personal achievement. But if you want to bring 28 member states in the European Union, the 47 in the Council of Europe with you, you go slower, but you get much better results at the end of the day. And I, I think that's where, where Europe fits in. So um, I think former US President Jimmy Carter said in 2003 that the w abuse of women and girls is the most pervasive and unaddressed human rights violation on earth. And that continued, that was just that was three, three years ago. So um, we've signed the Council of Europe, we're looking forward very much to moving and, and ratifying it in this country. Um, 28 member states in the European Union, uh, 14 have, have ratified it. And <coughs> Minister Staunton outlined previously where Ireland is moving in that direction. 
Recently, the MEPs in the Parliament passed a motion for resolution calling on member states to implement the agreement without delay. It stated grave concerns about the extent of violence against women in the EU. Notice the huge disparity that there is uh, in terms of reporting <coughs> of violence, of violence against women. We've had that in the previous session as well. Uh, your, our focus today is on data and ensuring that we collect data and that we move to that, that gold standard. And proper data, as we all understand, is key uh, in developing policy to, to respond. Um, and in terms of the Council of Europe, uh, the Grivio uh, reporting procedure that Christina outlined is certainly going to be very important because now we have ev every country will have to report. There will be, and it's that's launched this year. We're going to report across the various issues, so we will have data, real data that we can can work with. Chapter 11 of, of the Convention is going to be extremely important and data. I'm not going to go over again the very re relevant points that were made in the previous session about the value of data, collecting data and how we use it. While it's always, always respecting, um, res respecting the privacy of the individual. <coughs> so I'd support completely the establishment of a gold standard of, of, of data collection. The European Commissioner this year in, in, in November, in, um, well at the start of our 16 days that we've come to an end of now, um, we launched their initiative on some c on and um, outlined areas wh where they're going to, where we're going to work and to, to get to a point where all where the 28 members of the European Union will actually ratify the convention, and that's extremely <coughs> an important. And it's a challenge because two countries haven't even signed it yet. So is, is it a challenge? But we will get there. It's a, it'll be a longer, <laughs> a longer race, a longer run, but we will, we will get there. Um, so next year, 2017. Is to be is to be get a year dedicated to combating the violence against women, and there is funding, some funding co coming to support that. And awa awareness is, is so important, and that's what these 16 days that we've come to an end of now have been about raising awareness. Uh, we all know in this room we, we 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 know the issues. We think we know all the issues. Maybe we <laughs> not all up on, on the on the one level, but certainly I think outside this room we need to educate and raise awareness, and particularly educate. Uh, our boys, and I think it's, it's a point that I agree entirely with Lynn when she raised it in terms of education, raising awareness, uh, and telling the stories. And I was struck last night, I was travelling back from Brussels and get very bad coverage, and it's hard to read. You can't, you sit, when you land in Dublin Airport, then you have to turn on, read, read uh, try and get a news feed. There was a report from a Scottish MP yesterday in the uh, Scottish Parliament, Michelle Thompson. She had, she's now, I don't know what age she is actually, she's over, she's over, she's beyond her mid-40s anyway, because she, at 14 years of age, she, uh, she was raped uh, by a person in that circle of trust. And I'm sure Norman will tell much about the circle of trust. And she spoke in the parliament of the shame, disregard, how she felt, how she'd let, her, let herself down, let her family down. Um, her four, she left her 14-year-old self behind following that incident. She moved away from her friends. She never spoke and never told her parents. Her mother has died of cancer since. Uh, she spoke in the Parliament about the guilt, <coughs> the guilt particularly, and the fear uh, that she had and the anger. She's, and in her mid-40s, 30 years after that incident, she finally, she looked for help and she has help. So she, um, she spoke very powerfully yesterday. I think the st stories always tell, 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 a, tell a, the stories really underline the statistics. But she spoke, she gave a very personal testament and she'd moved many people to, t to tears in the Parliament <coughs> yesterday. And I think... Um, those those stories and the need to a very brave lady, very brave. <coughs> she is a public representative. She said it in the, the national parliament, and the, it's a ve very difficult thing to do. But I would hope that what and I know what she has done has certainly raised awareness. And many people we know that domestic violence crosses all social bands. There is no, it doesn't. There there are no boundaries. So this we we some we spoke about statistics. And I mean, everybody behind every statistic there is a story. <coughs> But the Euro European Commission uh, gave us some, some insight recently. One in four across Europe do not report uh, sexual violence and because of shame. One in five do not want anyone to know, and one, of ten one in ten believe that the role will not do anything, uh, uh, that the police will not do anything if they report it. Um, so that's what these events are about. That's what the 16 days we ha have, have had, we've come through, are about, and supporting people to come forward and to help them. Um, and costs were mentioned. Costs across the European Union are is estimated 226 billion. And that if we could reduce domestic violence by 
that would be a reduction of, ten, of, of 7 billion. So we don't want to talk about economics really, but I think they're, um, they're, they're from statistics that the Commissioner raised with us recently, or, or was it was released recently um, at the start of this 16 days uh, in when we were highlighting the issue of violence against women. But I, I'm really, you know, I, I apologize because I'm leaving, but I've been here for the morning and I'm really, uh, I think it's, you, you, I can see, you can see particularly in Christina's um, outline of where we're going across Europe and where Ireland fits and how we're going to move to a place where 47 states, 47 countries in the Council of Europe actually do sign up um, to, to, the, to the Istanbul Convention. I'd recommend any of you, any, any, any time you are thinking of traveling in Europe, do come to Strasbourg. Do come and see and look and stand back and admire the building as that is uh, the European Court of Human Rights that guides so much of what we do. Now Ireland is a signatory or has been a member of the Council of Europe since 1948, before we were ever a member of the European Union or the European Economic Community as it was then. So 1948, we're one of the founding members and um, we continue to play our role and continue to have an input into that. And I'm very proud of the, uh, uh, proud of, um, look back fondly with the time I spent there because it is an extremely important parliament when you look around and you see all the countries that don't have any other forum. We take it as, we have our European Union forum Many of those countries don't have any other forum where they get together and actually sit, discuss policy, and try and, and the others try and influence and try and get everybody to the one standard that is a gold standard. So thank you for your attention and thank you for the panelists and all those who have been involved <laughs> in bringing today. Thank you, Deirdre, and thanks. I know you're extremely uh, busy this morning. So uh, our panel discussion. So we know that the case for the ratification and implementation um, of Istanbul hasn't just been met, um, it's it been exceeded at this point. We know that the need for a gold standard is beyond dispute, but what would a gold standard look like and what are our own key agencies and actors doing about the issue of data collection and analysis at the moment? Um, we're joined by a superb panel, Christina and Lynn have rejoined us. Um, uh, we've also been joined by Nolan and Sam who will introduce and uh, what we're going to be doing is just talking about that the gold standard, what it looks like and what we could do to get there. Um, often when I'm on TV or radio or conferences I'm the, the, the token chick um, as I've been dubbed in the past but uh, today I'm glad to see Sam Scriven is blessed amongst women um, and uh, you know there's a movement at the moment, it's very kind of high profile uh, where women are calling out all male panels or manals as we call them. Well, uh, today Sam Scriven is uh, sparing our blushes uh, for this panel discussion. I think what's really, really heartening um, about Sam, uh, he joined the uh, Central Statistics Office earlier this year, but he did so having um, worked uh, with Angarda Shekana um, as a crime analyst um, and providing analytical support for the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Unit. And he's going to speak to us about um, what has been achieved, I suppose, in the last couple of years, what needs still to be done, how, what we're doing right, and what challenges still uh, remain. So please give a warm welcome to Sam. <laughs> to contribute to this um, very useful debate on the Istanbul Convention. Um, the CSO are committed to supporting the establishment of the so-called gold, gold standard in data collection. Um, just to tell you what we do at the, uh, in the crime section of the CSO, uh, the CSO collates and publishes official crime statistics in Ireland. Um, <coughs> No, no, you're fine. Uh, can everyone, uh, I, I can hear myself now, so. Um, <coughs> uh, so the CSO collates and publishes official crime statistics in Ireland, and crime statistics are based on administrative data received from uh, Ungarda Shikona, which is based on crime incidents reported to and as recorded by, um, by the guards. Uh, the CSO also carries out crime and victimization surveys as part of its quarterly national household survey. These are face-to-face -face interviews with householders all over Ireland. Um, <coughs> the, issue, the issues of violence against women and domestic violence, and specifically for the CSO uh, regarding data collection and data quality, have been very high on the agenda in 2016. Uh, at a European level, the Directive on the, victim, the Rights of the Victims of Crime, uh, which became law in 2015, and of course the Istanbul Convention, each contain articles specific to data collection and the provision of data to the Commission. 
Um, the CSO liaises regularly with Eurostat on these matters. Um, the European Commission has also proposed to develop uh, a, Euro uh <coughs> a Europe-wide uh, survey on gender-based violence. Uh, at home, we continue to work with our data providers and Garda Sifana on matters of data, collect uh, of data collection and data quality. The CSO chairs an expert group on crime statistics arising out of the recommendations made in the Agarvia Inspectorate Report of 2014, which focused on data collection. The CSO is also nominated in the National Strategy on uh, Domestic, um, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence to produce statistics on incidents where an MO of domestic violence has been recorded. Um, official crime statistics uh, are based on the Irish Crime Classification System which is a classification which groups Garda reported incident types into groups such as homicides, sexual offences and assaults. Uh, official statistics do publish figures on the numbers <coughs> of, for example, breaches of domestic violence orders, but do not include figures on violence against women or domestic violence. The reason for this is that violence against women or domestic violence are not specific crime types in either Garda incident recording system or in the Irish crime classification system. And as such, until now, there has been no mechanism for extracting such crimes. The way by which a crime incident is recorded as having a, a domestic violence motive is by recording an MO of domestic violence in the incident record. Uh, the Garda Inspector Report in 2014 highlighted several issues in relation to the recording of domestic violence, inc do domestic violence incidents, including the recording of crimes in non-crime incident categories and the failure to record uh, MO. The CSO has published two quality reports in 2015 based on 2011 in administrative data and in 2016 based on 2015 administrative data uh, and reported uh, an apparent reduction in the recording of crime incidents in non-crime categories. Uh, the CSO uh, is now receiving uh, modus operandi data and while it will be technically possible to derive statistics on, on domestic violence crime based on this MO field at present, it would be essential for the CSO to carry out an assessment of the quality of this data prior to publishing any statistics. The assessment will seek to identify whether crime incidents involving domestic violence or sexual violence are being recorded as crime incidents and with the correct MO. Carrying out this assessment is a fundamental prerequisite to publishing statistics that users can have confidence in. Uh, we continue to work very closely with Angarda Shifana to um, improve the collection of quality data. Uh, when it has been established that reliable statistics on domestic violence and sexual violence incidents can be published, a number of other pieces of the gold standard will fall into place. Age and gender statistics for victims and perpetrators are routinely recorded and these will be possible to produce statistics on. The relationships between uh, victims and perpetrators is now also being recorded by Angarda Shifana and although the CSO has not seen examples of the data yet, it is certain that this will provide a rich data set for us. Um, this will permit the disaggregation of data according to these variables, subject to the constraints of data con confidentiality, which is a key priority for the CSO. Uh, other challenges remain. The collection of data relating to ethnicity and disability is much more difficult to obtain, as there is no obligation on witnesses or suspects to provide it. Uh, therefore, the complete the completeness of such data would be uh, open to question. Um, however, the greatest challenge, in my opinion, is the apparent absence of an agreed cross-agency definition of what constitutes gender-based or domestic violence crimes. And often, the pervasive understanding is that domestic violence crimes is restricted <coughs> to intimate, intimate partner relationships and to recurring violence. Unfortunately, uh, Joan Mullen uh, from Tesla couldn't join us um, this morning. Um, I think she lost her voice. Um, uh, one woman who will never lose her voice is our next speaker, <laughs> Nolene Blackwell, <laughs> who requires uh, no introduction but has been um, a powerful voice um, for so many people throughout uh, her 
uh, legal career and uh, it's so great to see her now as Chief Executive Officer of uh, the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, but of course we know her from FLAC and from so many other um, involvements. I think um, uh, you're going to maybe speak to the challenge of data collection and analysis for the NGO sector, mindful perhaps of, of, of Sam's kind of uh, uh, no, or, you know, observation that the main challenge actually is, is getting an agreed uh, definition across those agencies. But a warm welcome, please, for Nolan Blackwell. Do you see the way they brought in three newbies? Uh, Darvel's new in her job, Sam's new in his job, and I'm new in my job. Um, so, but actually the being new is relevant in my job. Darvel, will you stop me when I have to stop? Because I can go on about this for a while. <laughs> um, one of the uh, questions, uh, the CSO publishes the quarterly figures, as Sam was saying, um, and over the last two quarters, they've showed the rate of homicide going down and the rate of crimes of sexual violence going up. And in relation to, say, 2014 and 2015, homicides were down by something like 27%, and sexual offences were up by 15%. And the last quarter, it was up by 13% over the previous year. So it is my job, if somebody phones me up and says, what does this mean, to try and explain to them what it means. And the answer I'm left with is I haven't the foggiest notion, because it could mean either that more people are reporting crimes of sexual violence, which would be good, or it could mean that the rate of violence is increasing, which would be bad. But in the absence of a proper baseline, I couldn't tell which was which. I am deeply grateful to the Observatory of the National Women's Council for holding this conference because it proves to me I'm not the only person who hasn't been able to make head nor tail of what the problem is because we don't have the data to do it. And uh, I, looking around for, I think that business of a cross-agency definition would be great, but we're probably several steps away from even getting the cross-agencies to understand what each of the other is collecting. Um, and I'm taken back to something that the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women wrote back in 2003. I was actually going to claim it as my own, but there are some people who've been working on this topic for a while, and they'll probably recognize it. But it's really beautifully written, uh, so that's why I'm going to read it out. Violence against women must be addressed on multiple levels and in multiple sectors of society simultaneously, taking direction from local people on how women's rights are to be promoted in a given context. By working on the improvement of data and statistics on violence against women, adopting legislation that guarantees equal protection of law and the enforcement of its provisions, government can put in place the building blocks of a system that can respond more effectively to gender-based violence. The allocation of resources, support to research and documentation on causes and consequence, education and prevention are all needed. But, uh, and, and they're all necessary important steps. Now that's 13 years ago. And I just don't know how anybody manages, be they a government agency or an NGO, to know what the impact of our work is or anybody's work is if we don't have the baselines or the capacity to track the figures. I mean, it is interesting that the Garda figures were pulled there on foot of the inspectorate report back in 2014 in order to improve their data. But just yesterday, the CSO, I was checking my figures in case I was out of date, um, launched or had new data between 2010 and 2014, I think, Sam, which showed that in that period, sexual violence offences went down by 18%. Was that because less people were being violently assaulted? Well, I was working in an area where we were certainly hearing that there was a lot of stress on families during those years of the recession. Was it because the guards weren't available to take calls? We don't know. I mean, it is just desperate that we don't know what the basis of the problem was. So that's the collection of data by the guards, but that's not enough because if you look at the figures of reported uh, cases to the guards in sexual violence area, you get about 2,500 thereabouts for a given year. It's a bit more, a bit less, but say that amount. 
And then if you look at the number that end up charged in court with serious sexual violence cases, because that's the high court, you see maybe 150, that kind of thing. What happened? Were some of them so minor that they went into the district court? How were they counted there? How were they dealt with? We don't know. One of the ways you stop sexual violence is by holding perpetrators to account. You cannot hold perpetrators to account unless uh, you, you can say that people are going through the system, people are reporting, they're reporting correctly, it's being dealt with properly along the way. So the collection then of data by the courts is the next thing you look at. And you find that courts across the country effectively don't collect data in the same way within the one agency, not to talk of interagency. And they call um, violence against women, they deal with it by reference to the various charges or uh, cases that are brought in relation to barring safety orders or whatever. And then there are other agencies as well. We don't know, for instance, how well CUSC is doing on their awareness raising campaign, the, the state agency, because we don't know what we're starting from or what is triggering people to take action on foot of, of violence uh, that's, that's happening in our society. So what we do in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre is we record the number of calls that come in, we say what they're roughly about, we say the number of people we're dealing with. Our colleagues in the Rape Crisis Centre in Cork who are here today do the same thing, women say, we all do the same thing, we all record what we know. But they're anecdotal. And Deirdre Clune was right, that was a very powerful statement yesterday in the Parliament, but it's an anecdote. And if we are to have evidence-informed policy, evidence-based policy, but even evidence-informed policy, we need the evidence. And then what we need to do after the collection of it, though, is analyse it correctly. Because it seems to me that there are good bits of data around at the moment. But we're collecting a whole lot of data, some of which is weaker than others. And the analysis of it, the quality of the data collected, is very relevant. And the analysis of that data then, so tiny little studies which take place in part in uh, some sector of Ireland should not be given the same weight as, say, th an EU-wide survey which had a substantial sample from Ireland. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not into the data for the data's sake, but we cannot solve the problem we are in the, in the observatory. All of us who are in the observatory cannot solve the problem we have unless we can say to people, this is the problem and we know the solutions, or we can help you with the solutions. And we can't do that, and we, it has to be then analysed correctly. So I think it is to the credit of the state that the Child and Family Agency, CUSLA, has set up a domestic sexual and gender-based violence unit, and that it is attempting to collect the data. But, but we, it has to be able to talk to others working in the area to analyse how good is the data, how comprehensive is it, is it correct, and is it being analysed correctly? And going back to the state obligation under lots of international law, most recently Istanbul, you have to take into account the, the experience of the people working in the area as well when you're doing this. So the voices of the people affected by violence, men and women, but it is predominantly an issue for violence the violence against women is predominantly the issue. They have to be taken into account in the way that we actually gather in and understand the data better. There has been for a long time a call, and the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre has consistently called, my, for my predecessor, Ellen O'Malley Dunlop, w regularly explained how necessary it was to have another really good survey done in Ireland, a savvy two is what it's called, which would take a deep look at the incidence of domestic violence, sexual violence, gender-based violence in Ireland. That's really important. But even with the data that's there, are we analysing it correctly? Are we dealing with it correctly? That's one of the questions we have. And it's not for the sake of knowing the extent of the problem. It's, for the, it's in order to build proper solutions. We have to know what the problem is, and we can't do that without the data. So that's it. Thank you.
Jennifer, I might maybe just uh, before we go um, to the floor and if uh, this morning and the uh, the coffee break is anything to go by, I know we won't struggle uh, with getting some good questions and answers in this session. But I might maybe go to you both, Christina um, and Lynn. Just any observations just on on what you heard from both Sam and Nolene, and um, I suppose just in terms of of, of the challenges in Ireland uh, in both collecting the data and analysing. Yeah, well, I, I suppose it, it echoes what we were saying this morning about the need for the data to be collected to know the scale of the problem, but also then to develop the policy that actually fits that, that problem. Um, and without that, we are sort of flying blind. And I think we're all in agreement in this room that that's what needs to happen, but it's how do we make it happen? And again, it's just to echo that I think that we do have an opportunity because of the Istanbul Convention that Ireland could get its act together in having coordinated approach to collection of data and the sharing of the data as well between the different departments. Um, you know, and like, uh, you know, as Nolan was saying about the 150 reaching the high court and we don't know why. Do you know what I mean? That's, it's, it's just ridiculous at this day and age that we don't have that sort of analysis of the situation. So it is about a coordinated approach. And I just, uh, again, just that we seize the opportunity to, to do that and to get all departments, agencies talking to each other. And Christina, maybe might if you have any observations just on, on what was highlighted in particular uh, by Sam, just in relation to the lack of agreed definitions. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, what retained most of my attention was this notion that there is a lack of a cross-agency definition. <laughs> And as I mentioned earlier, um, also in the studies that were affected in the Council of Europe, uh, it was mentioned that perhaps it is very ambitious also to, to aim at, at such a definition. But, but clearly, whatever is done at the level of the various agencies is already a very important step towards moving in that direction and helping coordinate the work between the various agencies. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the floor now, but one of the questions um, I would have for the panel and indeed um, for the room is um, the question of funding the ratification and implementation um, of Istanbul um, because we saw um, with the uh, Victims Directive um, you know, last year the DPP and other agencies expressing concern about the impact that it might have on them if they were to give reasons and to fulfil the Victims Directive and this it seems to me is something that would require a serious amount of um, not just initial investment but sustained um, investment in order to um, to achieve it. Um, how confident, um, Lynn, would you be in you know in securing that? Because all the policies and conventions in the world mean nothing if we can't actually um, give effect to them. Exactly, and I suppose that was what I summed up the, the speech this morning, saying that we can have as many rules and regulations as mm -hmm. we want, but they're you know they're only worth the paper they're written on if you put the investment into it. Um, I suppose it goes back to that again, as I suppose we're not framing it in an economic sense, but if you can measure the scale of the economic cost mm -hmm. and why it's actually economically prudent mm -hmm. to put the investments in, which will then deal with the problem and prevent it happening in the first place. So you have to win that argument with, the, with those who hold the levers of power. But so maybe that's where the using the economic cost is a useful mm -hmm. argument for that because we would absolutely save the exchequer mm -hmm. in the long run. Nolan, do you think we should have, because we're all kind of couching it, we're all always nearly afraid to say that the business case for preventing uh, violence um, against women and others has not been met. I actually don't think we should apologise for that at all because 2.2 billion is a significant amount of money and that's a, at a conservative estimate and obviously the, the initial, um, you know, the socioeconomic or the social impact and the impact on lives individually, but there is a, a broader cost. And when you look at Savvy, look, I mean, it was such, it was such an investment that I think had so many returns. Mm. And we're still relying on it. But um, do, do, you, do you have a discomfort with you know kind of the, the economic cost of, of uh, gender-based violence being part of the, the broader debate? But it's, it's one of the pragmatic arguments. The cost of a, another savvy was tiny. Mm -hmm. Actually, everybody said it couldn't be done because it's so expensive. But the cost of another savvy would be a million euro. And the, uh, the Cornish uh, Minister for Justice said she was anxious to do one. She would put up a quarter of the budget. And she needed three other departments to come on board. That is 250,000 in departments in order to identify right across mm -hmm. the country what your issues are around violence. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not impossible. I think she still hopes she might mm -hmm. she might get it and do it. But I, I just think we don't we all all the time we look at the principle has to be right. You have mm -hmm. to identify what the principle is, and then you make the practical argument. And there are all sorts of practical arguments. Mm -hmm around changing it. And that is a huge scandal if we are wasting all of that money 
when we could be using it in a much more effective way. So I, I'd say, I'd say kind of anyone in this room, I'd find very few people who wouldn't be prepared to make the money argument <laughs> when it made sense. A lot of practical people sitting here <laughs> uh, today. Okay, well, look, the purpose of uh, this is to look at what a gold standard would look like and what um, we could be doing on the ground um, to, to facilitate that. So we would welcome any um, questions, perhaps if you, there's a roving mic, if you identify perhaps who you are and um, if uh, required who you want to direct your question um, towards, but we would welcome, um, this is uh, your, your time now to, to take part and please feel free to interrogate all the panellists, but not me. <laughs> Hi, good morning, or rather good day. <laughs> My name is Laura Bortel, I'm from Pabby Point Travel and Bournemouth Centre. Um, and I just have a, a comment, a question, and another comment, um, so I'll try to do it quickly. Just in terms of the definition uh, of gender-based violence um, that was mentioned, I think it's really, really key that we actually do define that, because if we define it uh, in terms of gender neutrality, um, it, it risks it has huge implications uh, for women who are disproportionately impacted by it. Um, so it's a crucial question to look at um, because it will also impact our funding priorities. Uh, do we prioritize funding uh, in a neutral way or in a way that um, you know, it should be to address actually gender-based violence? Then the other thing is for Sam, I suppose, on the ethnic data collection. Um, and I'm wondering, could you maybe elaborate on some of the challenges faced um, in, in, in trying to promote that piece of work. And then just to reiterate what Nolene okay. was saying in terms of the learning and the practice on the ground and the knowledge on the ground. Um, and just to suggest for the CSO, for the Gardaí, and in fact the COSC Data Committee to tap onto that knowledge that civil society organisations have. So for instance, in relation to ethnic data collection, uh, there are agencies such as Pabby Point who are working on, on ethnic data monitoring um, and to tap onto that knowledge and expertise. Uh, so we would very much welcome uh, collaboration uh, with the civil society, between civil society organisations and um, the state agencies. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Sam, would you like to, to respond to that? Uh, yeah, thanks very much for your question. Um, I suppose uh, in terms of the collection of ethnic data, what we don't have in this country is um, <coughs> a national identifier for the justice agency. Uh, we don't have a national identity card, which might be linked to other information on the person. Um, so the only data that we can collect from persons is, is what we ask of them. Uh, and often, for many reasons, it can be um, awkward, inappropriate, um, unlawful to ask people their ethnicity or, or disability status. And therefore, at best, you're going to collect part of the data. Um, could I just add on to that, though, that people with disabilities, people who are ethnic minorities, for the most part, also want to recognize the special issues that they face. And this is where I think Laura's point of saying, ask us, because you're working on it already. You are working on a way that makes it respectful and proper to collect. It is possible to do it, even if difficult. And if, if, we're, not, if we're not taking those things into account, you said yourself, if, if we're not getting the reliable data that we need in order to so solve the problem. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, just uh, down towards back to my right. Tessa Collins from Pabby Point. Uh, just a comment that I would like to make when we're speaking about, again, about data is maybe try and get traveller and Roma women and men involved in services, employers, that we would know would be able to talk about our community. I think that would be a very important point too. That's great. Thank you. Yes, this lady just here in the front row. Do you have a, um, just a microphone here, and then we'll go to this side of the room. Hi, Didia Bourgeois. I, uh, I've been working with Roma people, uh, with uh, women, uh, Roma. And my question is, how we, uh, uh, which uh, uh, company or uh, service to, uh, to go and to ask we can train people from Roma community to, to, work, to work with Roma women because they are not so much and the it's a, a, a problem with them and we are just two mediators in all of Ireland and if we have a problem who can help us with that 
not just the departmental uh, social, you know, or I don't know. No, that's great. I, I think yeah. what uh, perhaps uh, Christina and what Miss Lizzie's trying to articulate is kind of the the, the lack of training um, affects lack of access, and then that in itself perhaps distorts the picture, and especially in circumstances where we know that uh, certain communities are perhaps disproportionately affected um, by, by this issue. Indeed, th th this is an area that um, the Istanbul Convention takes on board and gives a lot of attention to. It, uh, the questionnaire also that Gravel has elaborated contains very specific questions on initial training uh, that uh, members of the various professional categories that are in contact with women receive, but it also puts a lot of focus on um, lifelong training and uh, it, it uh, Gravel members will be looking at how regular uh, the training of the various categories are, what is the content also of the training that is being given, if it is uh, gender specific and so on. So um, yes, this is a very important pillar, I would say, uh, in, uh, in the Istanbul Convention. Thanks. We've got this uh, gentleman here and then to Margaret. Yeah, um, uh, a lot of people have referred to the importance of data collection. I agree entirely. Uh, good data is essential to understand uh, the, the scope of the problem. But uh, w one speaker actually referred to the fact that European data tends to be more accurate than our own data. And um, I have some reservations about that. Uh, I want to refer in particular to uh, a very wide survey that was carried out in 2014. It was carried out by the EUFRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency. And it interviewed 43,000 women throughout the whole of the EU. Not a single man was interviewed. And it produced data on the basis of that survey. And now, I think that's contrary to best practice. I, 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 in my opinion, when uh, it, these kind of surveys are done in countries like the US and, the US, uh, and Britain, they take care to uh, interview an equal number uh, of men and women, and they try to include couples actually as well so that they can check what's happening <laughs> between the couples and, and, and there's a kind of cross-checking going on. And I would like uh, in particular one of the panel to, um, to refer to that EO for a study and say do they actually support that and do they think that that was a uh, good practice? Okay, so obviously the, uh, UA, the EU FRA report, I remember reporting at the time, was uh, in itself uh, fairly um, groundbreaking, and it did canvas and seek um, the views of women. And I suppose it maybe goes to the, the heart of the observation. Um, I'm sorry, I just forgot your name earlier about you know um, the, the you know the, the cautioning against uh, gender neutralising an issue um, that, in my view, um, does uh, affect women more. But uh, there are implications um, arising from that. Well, I suppose maybe the panel, maybe Nolene, um, yeah. obviously, like e e even Sabe, obviously was, um, yeah. you know, uh, canvassed the views of, of, of both men and women. But in terms of moving forward for research, um, is it something that we need to do yeah. is to open the debate up more to include um, the voices of men who may both be affected by it, but also, um, for the most part, be perpetrators of such um, violence? I can, can I answer a slightly different question? Um, you can. Because, <laughs> because it's in my head, and I just want to get it out, and then I'll come back to that. Um, it, it, there's something about the quality of the data, what you're looking for. I, I think, in a sense, you have to look and see what are you trying to collect in any particular area. But was it just last week's Eurobarometer mm -hmm. came out with a Europe-wide study uh, where they had interviewed 1,002 Irish people as part of a, a Europe-wide study. And um, the evidence of that study was that 21% of people thought that there were circumstances yeah. in which it was all right to have sex without yeah. the consent of your partner, including walking along a dark road, wearing provocative clothing, and being drunk. Right, so mm -hmm. that was the finding. And it's interesting, that is interesting, because a thousand Irish people is not a, a tiny mm -hmm. number of people. So, th so that there are 210 people out there who think those things is a problem in itself. But the question then arose of what were the questions that were being asked? And all of these are fair questions. Each piece of research has its own methodology. Each piece of research that I have seen, being no expert on the topic, of course, I'll talk about it. But 
you, you, you're looking to see what was the research trying to find out in the first place and what was the methodology, which is why one of the things that I raised was the quality of the research. It's not just the collection of the figures. What is the quality of the research? What is being asked? And how then is that being interpreted? Because some of the interpretations coming out from data recently collected is certainly very dubious. Mm -hmm. So some of the assumptions being made about the fact that the problem is being properly addressed are dubious because they're based on pieces of research that are too thin. So all of those things are really important when you're looking at the question. And that's all, that's true of anything. Statistics can be used for a whole Any lot purpose. of things. And it's a question you have to be reasonable about the research and you have to do it. The truth is that we have to, I think Laura is quite right, let's get that definition right. The definitions, we know what we're, you know, we know what we're signed up to, for instance, saying of violence against women, we can do all of this, but we, we then, I think it is something of a disgrace, and it's only now coming to my head, that Sam said, when we get the data reliable, when we have reliable data, 2016, when we have reliable data, not your fault, you're new to the job, you have another six months. <laughs> um, um, maybe Christine and Lynn, uh, the voice of men in, um, in future or even in current research. As I said, like, I suppose this morning, you know, I have nothing against looking at domestic violence across the board, whether it affects men or women. And I think that's, and that was the point I was making about the, the Victims' Rights Directive will actually look at that and will collect that data and will then allow us, if we are misinterpreting, and mm -hmm. if it is a case that the scale of domestic violence is far greater against men than we ever thought, well then, that's why we need the data to, to assess that. I think picking and choosing certain studies and going, you know, why do they only ask women on this? Well, I could point out studies that only asked men questions. So it is, it's not even saying what was they, what were they trying to do with that report? And I, again, it's this divide, you know, and what about it yeah. drives me mad. I think we will have proper data if the Victims Rights Directive is properly yeah. implemented. And then if we have been wrong to date, well then I am, put my hands up and say, well then we do need to do more to, to help men who are in those circumstances. Christina. Um, I, 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 I think that this is an interesting point and that is to say that uh, of course I th we have to remain open to whatever uh, the data will, will show us. Um, for the time being, the data that is out there gives us clear reasons to want to focus on women. Mm -hmm. And and so that's what we're that's what we're doing. But uh, yeah. Okay. And there is a question here for Margaret, then to the front and back to the split. Which one is it? Margaret. Two things, I suppose. One was um, when we just over two weeks ago uh, Women's Aid launched a femicide report, and I think when you're talking about the killing of somebody, the information is fairly definitive. Yeah. Um, definitely, it's partial. There's a lot of information that is missing, and as Orla said. We very much welcome the commitment uh, from the Connacht to, to do a review of uh, domestic homicides from 2007 to 2016. <coughs> but the reality is that, that that gave us some very significant information. And I suppose I have a concern about how we move forward. And we are going to, to be moving forward with partial data. Mm. But I think where we can be honest about what is partial and what we need to get better about and what we're confident about to give us the information is really important. Uh, the, the thing with the definition sometimes is it can take an awful long time to get agreement. Mm -hmm. I think if we were to try and get a definition among all of the agencies within, the or within Ireland and then try and get it across Europe, I just wonder how long that would take. So I think it is sometimes it's about actually saying, okay, that is a goal that we need to move towards but there are things that we need to do in the, mean, in the shorter term, and some of that information is available. And I think it would be very helpful to have a sense of this goal set standard. I think for me today, I was hoping to get more illumination on what this goal standard will be, and what are the steps that we're going to take to get there. Because as one of the agencies that does collect, collect data, anecdotal as it may be, it is informing the picture of what is there. It may be partial, it may not be, 
anything. It's not like a survey, but it does add to the picture. And there is a major gap in a lot of this information. So I just would like so to... So for, for you, Margaret, then, what would be a kind of vital next step, then? Is it collaboration in the first instance amongst the agencies and here in Ireland? what we could expect next year. I mean, for example, the, the, the link between getting good data and informing action. We've had the biggest investment in the awareness campaign that was launched at the beginning of, of November. And I think it's even about thinking about how do you collect data that feeds into information. Up to relatively recently, people believed that women are at the highest level of danger on the street. What mm -hmm. our femicide research shows it's absolutely clear. clearly is that they are at the greatest level of danger is in their own home and from somebody known to them. So we need to move on the information that we have. Okay, Nolene, um, and I suppose there, there's probably a similar trajectory when it comes to sexual violence. Uh, yeah. the, the stranger danger uh, myth is yeah. sort of routinely demolished, demolished by the fact that it's usually intimate. Um, partner violence. But for you um, uh, in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, what are the next steps in a tangible way to work towards, even towards an Irish gold standard, let alone a European-wide one? Okay, so, so uh, with, without, without getting everything in line, it, it is that question of understanding, are you collecting what is collectible at the moment? And when that is being collected, is it being analysed? in an agreed way, in a, new, in a neutral way, not a gender neutral way, but just a neutral way, not trying to push one policy or another. So in some ways, the gold standard for me would be something which is, I did write it down as something, yeah, where, where the data is collected, where the appropriate data is collected, that it is good quality data, and that it is analyzed in an expert way. So they're, like th they're not actually that hard. We should be doing it anyway. We're kind of wasting money if we're not collecting the right information in the right way and analyzing it correctly. So, so, you, so you just, I think, as Istanbul is being developed and as it is being monitored towards development, all of the agencies can be asked, are they giving the right information? to the CSOs, to other people, mm -hmm. is it then being analysed fairly and um, uh, uh, yeah, and, and are we getting the right quality of data? So is it a question then of pooling the data of all the relevant agencies or actors here in Ireland and then yeah. handing it over for an independent or expert analysis? Um, well no, I mean the CSO is quite yeah. expert in its own way and it can produce a good bit of it, but the analysis will be done with like by people like government departments, mm. Department of Education, Justice, whatever, like the Child and Family Agency. And these people then, I think the participation of the civil society in that process will give them the kind of insights that they need. And that's actually required mm. in any gold standard or in any human rights process <coughs> as well, that the people who are affected by it are involved in the decision making or in the Sam, development. Sam, if the CSO does anything, um, it, it produces its uh, reports in a, in a neutral way. It's, it's not uh, kind of subjective or, or value um, based. What do you think could be done at, at, at a domestic level to kind of work towards that gold standard? Or what advice would you give to the agencies or, or people here? I, I suppose from our own point of view, um, and I'm speaking as a statistician, it's relatively easy to count things when, when you know what it is that you're mm -hmm. counting. Um, so the definition is, is pretty crucial to mm -hmm. us in terms of differentiating between what is a domestic violence or sexual violence incident and, and what isn't. And, and without that definition, uh, you're going to always have grey areas in between the two. Um, to be honest, I, I, I do feel that uh, when you solve the data quality issue with regard to um, categorising it into sexual or domestic violence, the rest of the gold standard becomes easier because mm. those variables are already recorded. Um, <coughs> ultimately, the challenge is taking, for example, a set of assault crimes and, and subsetting them into assault crimes mm. that are motivated by domestic or sexual violence. That's the biggest challenge for now, mm. I think. Yeah. Okay, sorry. There's a lady at the front here. I'll go here and then over to this side of the room and then to the gentleman at the back. So, what I might actually do is maybe just take one, two, just those three questions together. Maybe if you just, yeah, work away. My name's Alison and I work 
um, well, I do research in Trinity in the health sector and health policy and some database. I have a question, I don't know how feasible it will be, but definitely will not be that costly and can look at the hospital. And mm -hmm. why can we have a satellite system, we use it for medical records, so just put a satellite system to all the uh, agencies that deal with crisis and of course in Algarda, blah, 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 blah. And there will be one base that co will collect data. I think it's very important to eliminate the human intervention when it comes to interpretation. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, human intervention is, in is very, very crucial to put the data in. <laughs> so why is it so, I do understand the cost, but the cost will be less if we right mm -hmm. now discuss the impact that violence has on society. Mm -hmm. So would it be feasible to have a satellite system uh, equivalent to the medical record system that we have in some of the hospitals? I think uh, it's an interesting question. When you look at area, other areas such as bail um, and the that continual problem we have of the lack of agency speaking to each other, whether it's the court service, to the Gardaí, to the judiciary. Um, a satellite system, Lynn, I think would uh, would cost a lot, an awful lot of money. I, to be honest, I don't fully understand yeah. what the, the satellite system would So be. essentially a, a, a unified system where various <coughs> actors or agencies would speak to each other. And we also, we continually see gaps in this where perhaps in the case of bail, um, you know, maybe the, the Gardaí aren't talking to the court service and things fall through the lap and I suppose, or fall through the loops and I suppose maybe it's speaking to that, would it require that kind of, um, a huge investment to introduce like, and, and in especially I suppose an information or IT system that, that would collect that. See how the new yeah. we'll have to see how the new data protection uh, directive will interact with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. um, I just want to see um, there's a gentleman down the back here, um, if you want to direct your question. That's actually got a very interesting point, I think, um, and it'll be 2018. But you know um, the, how, how we're actually building up for the GDPR coming in yeah. and how that's going to affect um, the work of of everyone. I think yeah. that's going to be a very very interesting yeah. point and challenge um, for any new systems that come in. But this gentleman here. Um, hi there, my name is Neil Rafter and I work with the Irish Criminal Reform Trust. Um, I just had a question relating to awareness raising on the issues of domestic violence and I suppose more generally sex sex sexual offences as it would apply to. Just Ms. Blackwell put forward the point that people constantly are talking about the whole asking for it issue and saying that it somehow makes the, the fear of rape or sexual mm -hmm. assault not okay. Well clearly the, the awareness and education as to what constitutes this, this issue within the Irish public isn't there and there's a need for education on that and it, I w it isn't so much a question as just me putting forward the view that that should occur at the earliest stage possible mm -hmm. uh, at school level and I, I've been in school in the last 10 mm -hmm. years not a lot that long mm -hmm. ago so I know for a fact that it doesn't happen now Mm -hmm. and it, it occurs at the university level on a voluntary basis in some places but mm -hmm. it's disgusting that it needs to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, Nolan, if you want to take that up. I've always kind of felt the view that uh, the, there was supposed to maybe s some cultural elements including the fact that 90% of our, uh, you know, our primary schools and national schools are, are Catholic maintained and controlled, I feel. That's been a mm -hmm. huge barrier culturally and historically uh, to, to education and awareness um, around issues such as sex and um, consent. I know certainly going to a convent school it, it would have affected uh, the, the manner in which we were um, taught those issues. But that need, we've seen it, uh, Nolene, in a lot of college campuses. There's yeah. now much more awareness. And in, in some colleges in the US, it's compulsory yeah. uh, to go through that kind of awareness training. But maybe just to speak to that, I mean, that kind of, I think what you're saying is the missing piece, but the education and awareness. And to yeah. what extent is having proper data um, yeah. important and relevant to, to developing education policy? Well, well, I think it would make the case back to stronger if we had the data that, that that's happening. But you, you get no argument from me about what you said at all. It is absolutely essential. And there are some great initiatives done voluntarily by, say, kids in transition year schooling. There's one of our favourite in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre was done by County Mead School, Eureka Secondary School in Kells, where they did this fabulous 
poster and a whole course in transition year mm -hmm. on consent. And they're continuing it now in fifth year is they have this poster. It's the yes, not the dress. Um, and so there's a whole group of people. But interestingly, that kind of activity as well feeds back in different ways. We have older people coming in to us in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre saying the like of, I thought I had to put up with it. I think I might not have to. So, you know, that kind of a general discussion is very important as well. And it is for the benefit of young people who might so thoughtlessly get accused of a sexual offence, who might so easily fall into domestic violence because they thought it was normal mm -hmm. in a house or whatever, or might not know how to deal with it if they see somebody in trouble. For all of these reasons, the awareness raising that is being done uh, that needs to be done more and that needs to be built into people's whole way of thinking, that respect for bodily, mental, emotional integrity, respect for human rights, all that is, yeah, I, can't, I, doubt, you, I doubt you get any disagreement from the panel on that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. just yeah. to remind that that funding that we talked about in this morning's session, I'm not sure if you were here, about the EU, the year of uh, eliminating violence against women, I know it's only four million, but we should permit like for member states but the Irish government should be applying for it it is funding that's there for raising awareness and for doing education projects with children and I think we need to start at the primary school level mm -hmm. and it is about respecting each other's personal spaces and bodily integrity and then that leads up into because by the time you get to college you've already set that the patterns mm -hmm. are already too it's too late to and try I, and I change think it is so positive that yeah. young people are leading that debate, mm -hmm. are recognizing that they are not getting the skills that they need in order to handle the world, mm -hmm. and what sort of education system doesn't try to give people the skills they need to manage mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. That's great. I know there was a hand up over here. Did I see? Yes, that's the lady just towards the back. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lynn Cattle. I'm a researcher with the School of uh, Social social work and social policy in Trinity College and um, what's kind of coming, uh, coming across for me from this afternoon is a big emphasis on definition and what constitutes domestic violence and actually how that is uh, important that is for us to be able to talk about this issue and this is an issue internationally as well that limits mm -hmm. um, data collection and um, my point is it's an opportunity um, to have a look at how we're actually framing domestic violence so um, the gender-based violence um, analysis is excluding other groups of people. So it's an opportunity to look at how we're framing this issue if we're talking about um, a new definition of domestic violence. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for your comment. We've just got a few, few minutes left. And will I just check, is Mary Jane Real here still? Is she gone? Yeah. She's gone. Okay. okay. I saw a hand up here. Did I just, uh, yes, this lady just down near the front. Thanks. Yeah, just a very quick comment, and I think it ties into the last one. I think it's probably time to move away from a very legalistic understanding yeah. of what we mean by definition yeah. and to start maybe moving toward more towards kind of an operational understanding mm -hmm. of what domestic violence might mean. I think uh, the Sex Offenders Act 2001 has a legal definition of a sex offence, but it's certainly not all-encompassing. It would miss out on a lot of things based on motivation mm -hmm. or context. And I think we just need to start in terms of domestic violence looking at what are the operational or the contextual mm -hmm. issues that feed into that definition. It's and then it's very hard to get the police to do that, you know, because yeah. they will be recording in their mm -hmm. way, so it, it's a debate for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and certainly through, gosh, more than 10 years of, of covering, you know, these issues and seeing, um, because one of the things I did write extensively about was what the panel spoke to earlier, was about the attrition or the dropout or the fallout rates, you know, the huge gulf between the prevalence of uh, sexual violence and um, the the very you know the less than one in ten who actually report it and then of that one in ten of how there's an even smaller subset that actually make their way through to a prosecution let alone a conviction and any time I wrote about it I always tried to write in the last sentence that's such a pity that we don't stay the line because when it actually comes to conviction and sentence and um, we do actually have quite strong um, uh, rates of both conviction and custodial sentences you know so there is a huge huge um, I suppose just huge opportunities between that and it's, it was always that gulf between the prevalence and the actual prosecution I think that that um, w was most difficult um, I'm just going to I'm going to try and just maybe um, sum up it, it, it's uh, quite difficult but Sam spoke to us I think one of the most frightening things um, still to learn is um, he was talking about 
the finding block or the, the prerequisite that we need, which is the primacy of reliable data. And it seems to me it's just striking and kind of quite frightening that if we still don't have that yet, um, you know, how can we even ever possibly develop a gold standard? It seems to me that that's probably our first thing that we need to do, um, because he talked about how the provision of uh, rich data sets uh, can only come from reliable um, and agreed definitions, whether they're legal or operational. And you can see sometimes how we can get tied up, maybe, if we're so obsessed with definitions, and yet they do have an important role uh, to play, both legally and operationally. Um, Nolene spoke um, also, uh, from her perspective, the absence of a, a proper baseline um, data. Um, and we also just, something that's come up continually, is about the allocation of resources to both invest in and sustain um, data collection and analysis. And um, obviously we're looking at the primacy of both the quality, the analysis, and maybe that very, very important set, and I think it does affect media coverage of these issues, is then how is that data, even if it's good, even if it's been collected, how do we then interpret that? You know, and what does that, what messages does that um, send out? Um, we also kind of looked at how there can be a distorting, distorting effect if the collection of data by other key actors, such as the court service, or you know, the DPP or others, um, isn't aligned. Um, I think, Nolan, what you said is, um, we all um, record what we know, but it's anecdotal. And I think that's, you know, for the large part, that's one of, being one of the most difficulties. But I think um, if we say, if probably one of the biggest things I think I took from yours was that um, evidence-informed and evidence-based policy needs one thing, and that's evidence. Um, and uh, that uh, to, in order to, to build the proper structures, um, that's what we um, need. And I think that there, is, that there has been an acknowledgement that, um, that as part of that research, we need to um, understand the broader issues. And I think uh, just that lady just from Trinity just spoke to that there, that the risks of actually maybe making our, uh, our focus um, too narrow. So um, as a certain former uh, teacher might have said, a lot done more to do um, um, in this area. But I hope, um, like me, that you'd find um, this morning very, very uh, stimulating um, to go look both at the challenges um, and the opportunities. And I hope that, uh, like all other things, we won't waste um, a good crisis. But many, many thanks for, for inviting me on. Thank you. Thanks, Dara. Well, you've totally done my job, so I'm only going to be a second now. <laughs> you have summed up. Um, just yeah, thank everybody, really, for your participation today. It's been extremely useful for us all in the observatory. It really has put a spotlight on the issue, and this is going to be central to our work. And the convention clearly provides the sort of the impetus, the launching pad, in terms of making sure we are on the road to that gold standard. I want to really thank Derval for brilliantly chairing the session. Thank you. And I also really want to thank Christine for coming from the Council of Europe to us today and all of the speakers because I think it's been really, really valuable. And as I mentioned at the start, we were supported today by the European Parliament and there's an evaluation sheet on all your seats. So if you have a moment just to fill it in, we would really appreciate it. So thank you and we're going to have some light lunch now as well. Thank you. Thank you.